Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and a very warm welcome to this policy dialogue organized by the European Policy Center and the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group, otherwise known as BIAPAG, which is an initiative of the European Fund for the Balkans and the Center for the Southeast European Studies at University of Graz. It is that time of the year again uh, when the European Commission takes stock of the progress made by the Western Balkan countries and Turkey on the respective path towards the EU, but also when the Commission thinks ahead about the reform priorities, the support and, and, and approaches that would help to advance the enlargement dossier in the future. These reflections uh, are part of the enlargement package uh, that was issued last month by the European Commission, and they will also be the focus of our discussion here today. Who is faring well among the EU hopeful countries in the Balkans? Who leads the way and who is lagging behind? Who has come a long way and who has hardly moved? Who is the eager beaver and who is the underachiever? who's getting A for effort and who has their work cut out? What are the main trends shaping up in the region and what are the key stumbling blocks? What is the to-do list for the different aspirant countries and how does the EU plan to help the region, but also the credibility and transformative leverage of, of its policy? These are the kind of questions that my distinguished panel of speakers will, will tackle today. I'm thus extremely pleased and, and very honored to welcome and introduce to you Maciek Popowski, Director General for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations at the European Commission, um, Florian Bieber, Professor of Southeast European History and Politics at University of Graz, and also Coordinator of the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group. And very soon with us um, will also be Natasha Wunsch, who is assistant professor at Sciences Po, uh, senior researcher at ETZ Zurich, and her too, a member of the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group. As ever, we'll first hear briefly from our speakers, and then we'll open up the panel for questions and comments from the audience. All participants are free to um, uh, send us their written questions and comments uh, at any time during the event in the designated box um, that you can all see on your screens. Otherwise, please click on the raise hand button and I will invite you to intervene uh, live uh, during the Q&A later on. Without further ado, uh, I come straight to Mr. Popovsky. Thank you very much, sir, for making the time to be with us here today. I would just kindly ask you for a start to walk us through the main findings and recommendations of this year's enlargement package. Mr. Popovsky, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Corina. Thank, thank you to the EPC, thank you for having me. Actually, uh, uh, a discussion on the package with the EPC is a part of a package because we did exactly the same thing last year um, when I, when I uh, arrived in my, my current position. Also with Professor Bieber, so I'm very happy we meet again, um, because the uh, of course this is the highlight of the year, and and we also want to uh, to spread the message and also discuss in a very open manner to hear from from all stakeholders and and interested uh, parties. Um, let me start with a little bit of the context that of course we know, so I won't be long. Um, uh, you know we. Um, uh, we always uh, underline uh, the our our conviction uh, that the future of of, uh, of the Balkans is is in the European Union, and that was strengths once again uh, when uh, President von der Leyen went on her Western Balkan tour in in uh, September. She visited all the countries there uh, with the message of encouragement and and support. And then it was very much in focus at the Bordeaux summit uh, with Western Balkan leaders um, at the beginning of, um, of October. So there is no lack of, uh, uh, of commitment. Um, 
And uh, on top of that comes the, co the, the, the context of, uh, of COVID response and post-COVID uh, recovery. And, and it's interesting, it's not, of course, what we've done is, is important and, and it was actually a lot. But what I wanted to um, sort of showcase is the logic that we followed. We basically decided to treat the Western Balkan countries as if they were already members of the EU. So all kind of support schemes and cooperation schemes were extended to the Balkans, whether it was green lanes, joint procurement of, uh, of protective equipment, participation in the EU health committee. Th these were the early days of, of COVID. And then uh, the whole, um, the, the issue of long-term recovery is also done in sync. So uh, with the economic and investment plan that was presented roughly a year ago, a little more than a year ago, we put in place uh, uh, an important uh, uh, recovery instrument uh, with a with a with a budgetary endowment of nine billion euros that could uh, result in in investment of up to uh, uh, an investment of up to twenty billion uh, euros. So this is this is uh, the general context we uh, we operate in, um, and the main difference between all the reports the past years and, and this year's report is that this one was drafted in full uh, conformity uh, with the new enlargement methodology. It was presented and, and adopted by uh, the council already in 2020, but that was the first full reporting year in which we could uh, draw lessons, I mean, and, 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 and draw on the uh, enlargement methodology and it's for uh, principles, more credibility, more predictability, more dynamism and stronger political steer by, by member states. There are also some uh, very visible changes. Uh, for instance, the, uh, uh, the clustering of, uh, of chapters, that's, the, that's the, the novelty. So under the, the revised methodology, um, we put even a greater focus on, uh, on the monitoring of reforms and the fundamentals. They still remain at the very center of the uh, enlargement process. Um, sufficient progress needs to be achieved in the fundamentals cluster before any other clusters can be, can be, can be opened. And this approach, I, I think, is, is well reflected in, in the reports, country reports and the, the Chapeau communication. Uh, and and all, all of the reports offer a more detailed assessment of the developments in this, uh, this area. Um, we have drawn, as usual, so that's not a novelty, uh, but we have drawn on a wide range of different sources when preparing our assessment. So it's not something that we just develop uh, in, within our Brussels bubble. Um, uh, we, we've, been, we've been in touch with many international organizations, civil society, and probably including many of you, uh, of you present in this virtual meeting room. Um, so um, this year, in line with the revised methodology, uh, the package also includes um, an annex setting out a number of third-party indicators related uh, uh, primarily to the rule of law and, and the economic uh, uh, criteria. So we have now strong conditionality and, and merit-based elements and, and improved readability of the, of the, the reports. We need to ensure um, uh, necessary incentives and, and political steer to, to, make, to make progress, which means uh, uh, we should be able to move forward with the enlargement agenda when conditions are met. Uh, we all know that there was a delay on the, on, on, uh, on the important decision to adopt negotiating frameworks with Albania and not North Macedonia, and it had an impact on the whole region, not only on those two countries, but on the region as, as a whole. And as enlargement policy is merit-based, we um, still uh, believe, we are convinced that both countries have delivered on on reforms, and that is once again clearly stated in, in, in the enlargement package um, that both Albania and North Macedonia have delivered on what they had to deliver, and, and they fulfilled conditions for the opening of, uh, of the accession talks. 
So our recommendation is once again to adopt the negotiating uh, frameworks and to make sure that the first intergovernmental conferences can happen as soon as, as possible. And this is now, uh, I mean, th this is basically being discussed as we speak, you know, because the, uh, the, the debate in the council has already uh, started. The, the package also recognizes the importance to move forward with the accession negotiations with Montenegro and, and, and Serbia. Notably, with regard to Serbia, uh, we acknowledge that uh, the wish of Serbia to open cluster three, which is competitiveness and inclusive growth, and cluster four, green agenda and sustainable uh, connectivity at the next uh, intergovernmental conference. It, it, it was based on um, a very thorough analysis of the progress made by Serbia in the reporting period. And we, we think that they, they have fulfilled the necessary conditions. Um, so we could we could go ahead and open both both clusters. Uh, with Montenegro, we have opened all. Um, so um, the the um, uh, but we still see um, a merit in in having an intergovernmental conference uh, in 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 December just to take stock and to look ahead. And I have to say, uh, I attended the two first intergovernmental conferences under the new methodology back in June in Luxembourg. And, and I could see the difference. And also in my old life, when I was still on the other, I mean, the receiving end of the enlargement process, I've attended many uh, intergovernmental conferences. Uh, and this was different. I mean, there was a different dynamism. There was a real exchange. Okay, it was well, I mean, it was, the attendance was very high. Both prime ministers, Skripo Kapic and Brnabic were there and, and, and a lot of EU ministers themselves. So, but there was a lively exchange on, 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 on the prospects, on the reforms, on the priorities. So we want to maintain that dynamic, that, 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 that dynamic, I'm sorry, because it's good for, um, for, the, uh, for, the, for the process. Um, coming back to the package again, uh, it's not a new conclusion, uh, but we are not there yet. Uh, we think it's time to deliver on visa liberalization uh, for Kosovo. Uh, and it's really important to encourage the, uh, all the countries to, to persevere on their EU path and, and, and to ensure that the credibility of the and to ensure the credibility of the EU uh, in enlargement uh, policy. Of course, the picture is is quite diverse. I don't want to go into details of all the country reports. If there are questions, I'll be happy to answer them. We know that Bosnia and Herzegovina still needs to deliver on the fourteen key priorities for for the EU uh, process. Um, as well, uh, but what we need now is to uh, you know, to send a signal, a positive signal, to maintain this dynamic, uh, to, to to grasp the momentum. So, what's going to happen next? Uh, the the member states already started discussing council conclusions. We know what happened last year. The council, in the end, did not adopt conclusions. And this is something we uh, would rather avoid uh, because I think we have things to say. Uh, and for the time being, I think that the discussion is, is, is constructive. I don't want to prejudge anything. Uh, it only started uh, 10 days ago, uh, but it's really something we need uh, to see. And then uh, we are really hopeful that we'll be able to hold those four intergovernmental conferences in, uh, in December. I know it's not... It doesn't hinge upon the findings of the enlargement report alone. That's pretty simple. Um, the, um, we are all aware of the ongoing discussions between uh, Bulgaria and North Macedonia. Uh, the situation uh, in both countries is, is quite complex because of the electoral calendar and, and internal developments. Um, but this is, uh, this is a fact of life. Um, so we have to uh, we have to live with that, but we are really determined to um, to make progress uh, and to maintain a dynamic. And we don't want to to lose uh, the Balkans. We don't want to let down the people of the Balkans. And and to uh, to, to conclude, I mean, I I, uh, I I read with interest the paper that you that you issued uh, ahead of this event, the one called "Escaping the Transactional Trap." Um, and of course, uh, you are right to, to push us to be more ambitious. You're also pointing to certain uh, dangers or, or risks, like the, the potential loss of loss 
of, of public support for the enlargement policy. I mean, we see uh, in some cases figures, figures dropping. The overall level of support is, is still high, uh, but it cannot be taken for granted. I agree, I agree. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, we all know that we are not uh, operating in a vacuum. So it's not that, that we are the only partner uh, with an agenda. Maybe we are the only partner with a positive agenda in Balkans, but we are in a certain kind of competition uh, with others. So um, uh, we want to make sure that everybody understands that our offer is real. And, and then, then, then um, uh, that hopefully that will be confirmed uh, by the Council in December. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for, for this introduction. Um, and, and for mentioning also the paper, I mean, uh, um, Natasha will join us a bit later and uh, she will walk us through, through, through the contents of that paper. I, I posted the link to the paper and to an infographics that was realized by uh, EFB um, and you can find the, uh, the, the links into the uh, chat box uh, for those who are interested to, to have a look at, uh, at, at these documents after the meeting. Um, now, Coming back to, to your intervention, if I can follow up with a, with, with a couple of questions. So, of course, um, uh, you're right that we need a positive signal and, um, and I think we should um, expect the, the best, but, but maybe we should also prepare for the worst. And so um, I'm wondering, um, what do you think is at stake if, um, if, the, if the member states fail again to, um, to deliver on their promise to uh, North Macedonia and Albania? So that's, that's the one question. And, 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 and the other would be um, beyond the, the, um, the situation in uh, North Macedonia, and, and of course, beyond the point that you've made uh, linked to the visa liberalization for Kosovo, Kosovo and the situation in Bosnia, I wonder, in more general ter uh, terms, what are some of, um, what are a couple of, 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 of particular challenges that need to be overcome uh, by the uh, aspirant countries, and, and how, how do you propose uh, moving forward on some of these issues? So a twofold question, if I may, follow-up yeah. question, if I may. Sure. Look, on, on Albania, not Macedonia, really, they have delivered on, on the reforms. They've, they've, they've gone a long way. I, I know, and, and it's actually quite impressive when you look at the, uh, the actual uh, track record of the judicial reform and then the impact of the judicial reform in Albania, it's quite unprecedented. Mm -hmm. uh, I have the pleasure of chairing the, uh, the board of the International Monitoring uh, uh, Mission, the, uh, supervising the, the vetting process of the judiciary. This is a profound process and it has worked. I mean, it's still ongoing, but they've, they've, they've gone a long way. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we all, fully aware of the changes that have happened uh, in, in North Macedonia. Again, this is very far reaching and, uh, and uh, you know, we must not let them down. Uh, we really think we are ready. Of course, uh, we need all the member states on board and we're doing our utmost to facilitate an agreement. We cannot impose anything. Huh? We are there to help, um, but objectively, uh, these countries are, are ready to go. There is, a certain fatigue and the sense of disillusionment. And President von der Leyen, when she went on the visit, she was very much confronted with that, but it was also part of the, I mean, the, the main, uh, perhaps even the main reason for her to be there in person was this message of encouragement that you are not alone. And then we still have an agenda, we are with you. So hopefully um, uh, this is something that, I mean, an, an objective that all member states can, can agree upon. Um, on the challenges, there is no shortage of challenges uh, in the Balkans. Uh, when you look at the, the current stalemate in Bosnia Herzegovina, hmm? well, the fact that the, the state institutions are paralyzed. I don't want to dwell on the reasons, but it's a fact of life, which means that the constitutional reform is long, which, which has been long overdue, is so badly needed. Again, we are not going to write a new constitution for Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, but we can provide all kinds of legal and technical assistance to make it happen. And we know exactly what needs to be, to be done, but 
for that you need the political will of the um, uh, of the, the the whole political class actually in in the country another challenge of course that we know so well is the uh, is the serbia kosovo dialogue it is ongoing it's challenging and and the progress is slow uh, although there have been some positive developments and the, the week of the in, in, during the week of the, of, of the visit of president von der leyen they finally managed to strike a deal on this issue of, of car license plates, which flared up out of the sudden. I mean, it was not new, but, but it doesn't take much uh, for, uh, for a conflict to, uh, to be reignited in a way. But luckily, a solution has been found. And, and Miroslav Lajcak, our special representative for, for the dialogue, is very much into that. And uh, we are also uh, working uh, hand in glove with him. Yes, and, and what do you think about uh, rule of law and fundamental issues? I mean, we, we keep seeing that those come up as problematic over and over again in, in, in the country reports. What do you think that needs to happen to inject a more positive dynamics in, in what concerns the work that has to be done for those countries to, um, to meet and sustain democratic standards? It, it's a... It's a... It's a long process, of course, and they know exactly what what they have to do. And we have we have seen some progress in some countries, a bit less in others. Um, but I think they all realize that it's a central issue. So we cannot uh, make a breakthrough, and we cannot close the negotiations without a convincing track record on on the famous chapters twenty three and and twenty four. And there again, uh, we are not only preaching, but we're also ready to help. So for instance, we are working very closely with the Venice Commission. They provide all kinds of uh, um, legal advice uh, for the countries in the region. Uh, it worked quite well in Albania. Mm. I hope it will work in Bosnia-Herzegovina, where we also uh, rely heavily on the legal expertise of the, of the Venice, uh, Venice Commission. There it's perhaps even more uh, pressing because of the... Uh, uh, of the uh, well, necessary uh, implementation of, uh, of, of the Saidi and Finci ruling uh, of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are, we are following and watching very closely, but not only preaching from Brussels or criticizing, but also providing help. Another good example of us getting actively involved on the ground, not as the commission, but as the EU as a whole, is the, um, the so-called parliamentary diplomacy. I mean, the role that the, the members of the European Parliament played in, in uh, so facilitating cooperation between the opposition and the government, the ruling party in Serbia. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it will make a positive impact on the upcoming elections, and there will be accumulation of elections in Serbia uh, uh, in the first half of 2022. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Popovsky. Um, I will now turn to Florian, uh, and a big thank you to you too for, for accepting to contribute to this discussion, Florian. Um, what, what is your reading of the state of play on EU enlargement towards the Balkans? And do you agree with, with the Commission's evaluation and guidance for, for the period ahead? Thanks, thanks a lot, Corina, for having me again. Um, it's a pleasure to have this discussion, uh, although I would say that uh, it's not a very happy environment actually to have this conversation, um, and not for the efforts or the lack thereof of the commission, but the overall context is rather discouraging. And I think we have to be quite honest about it, that uh, while the report, I think, reflects uh, some of it, it is really not, uh, not, not a good time uh, in the region. Um, uh, for the more specific analysis of the individual reports, I refer to, to our BPEC colleagues who have commented on the individual country reports very briefly. I'm uh, sharing the, the, the link in the, in the chat. It's available for everybody to take a read. And they are just kind of quick responses, which overall uh, suggest with some, you know, some observation that the reports do reflect the reality, although uh, our colleagues in Serbia find that sometimes they're a little bit less critical than last year's report. And, uh, Maybe the, 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 what Mr. Popovsky is saying, that there's some progress is not, at least not widely shared in Serbia, or there's a, uh, this fundamental challenge we have with a lot of these uh, reports is that 
technically there might be progress, but how does it match up with the larger landscape of rule of law and democracy in the country? And this is often this kind of uh, challenges is that the, uh, the commission's reports uh, accurately reflect very often the technical progress, but sometimes uh, lack the, the, the lack the ability to capture the full political uh, context in which they take place or, or don't take place. And this is, I think, one of the challenges. But to take a step back, I mean, uh, Natasha Wunsch will tell us shortly about the brief, but I wanted to say we, you know, the, the, the problem is not just that we have one country, Serbia, where basically barely a majority of citizens want to join the European Union, but we have a picture of all in the region where increasingly citizens don't believe that they will ever join the European Union. Um, uh, we look, we asked citizens this summer in a regional survey whether, uh, when do they think they will join the European Union? A quarter, basically, of all citizens of the Western Balkans say, Never. Um, and another 13% say within the next 20 years, so kind of a long time horizon. Um, the highest number of the nevers is in Serbia, um, ironically, one of the officially front runners in the process, and uh, in North Macedonia, for of obvious reasons, the multiple frustrations with vetoes has uh, given rise to that number, it increased sharply over the last year. But it means that um, in those countries, uh, uh, the largest individual section of, of citizens in the kind of ask these questions are those who believe um, their country will never join. And of course, this is a problem. Um, it's a problem which we have to face because it removes the pressure from elites to push for the reforms necessary. Um, because if citizens don't believe they will join, why bother do it, do their job, do their homework? Um, as it's often said. And I think this is one of the difficulties is that while they might do some technical parts of the story, um, uh, there are uh, the motivation for engaging in substantial and difficult reforms uh, is low and lower and it's been decreasing um, in recent years. It's, it's not, you know, in a certain way we see uh, with the election results in North Macedonia at the local level and the subsequent turmoil over the resignation of the prime minister, it you know, basically tells a message of saying, if you are putting all your eggs in the EU basket, so to speak, as the North Macedonian government did, uh, you end up basically being humiliated in the polls uh, and uh, put in a very difficult position. And we've had comments from uh, you know, neighboring countries like Serbia, where politicians uh, from the ruling government have said, well, you know, you shouldn't have hedged all your bets on the EU. You should have put some eggs in the Chinese basket, in the Russian basket, in the Turkish basket, and then you wouldn't be in such trouble. And of course, this is not the right message because the message of the EU is not one about transactionalism. You deal with everybody and with us as well, but you, 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 know, you make a certain commitment. It's not just about joining the EU, but it's about the values and, and the larger package. And I think if citizens don't believe it's going to happen, or at least not in their generation, then the incentive to make the difficult decisions is decreasing. And I think, so it's less a critique of the report. I think the report highlights many of the individual problems. Um, it, as it's, it's, it's a diplomatic uh, and uh, a, a, a document which cannot uh, replace the political will, which is at the end of the day necessary. And we've seen this in Burdo, uh, this disconnect, which many of us have noted. Um, between the reports which talk about an ongoing process and the political reality, which uh, is much more muddled and much more confusing. And I think without that kind of political message and uh, the, the difficulty with the E word, uh, as I think, Karina, you have described it, uh, the enlargement word, um, makes it, of course, very hard for the reports to have the power they once had. And I mean, uh, if we had this uh, conversation five, six years ago, you know, uh, the reports would have been read, uh, you know, with a with a comb uh, in Belgrade, Skopje, Tirana, uh, Pristina, Sarajevo, and Podgorica, um, and analyzed for all indicators. And now they've become much more of a non-event. Um, and that's a pity. I mean, it's not because of the, I think the reports today are much better than they were five years ago in many ways in terms of their analysis and, and also more critical voices, but it shows you something is happening which, which is not encouraging for the European enlargement um, and, uh, and the process. And um, it's less about saying the responsibility is exclusively within the European Union, uh, or in fact, mostly within the member states, I would say so. so but uh, it's also within the Western Balkans. But it is this unholy alliance of the blockers of enlargement and the uh, false friends of enlargement uh, in the region, 
which continues to 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 bother uh, it's the process and uh, while I think the analysis is correct uh, in the report, we don't see yet the big idea, and maybe the reports are not the place for it, but the question is really, how do we get out of this trap? Uh, is there a way out of it? And uh, certainly we can't propose one. We all know it's difficult and it's not, there's no easy solution. Um, I think uh, we in BPAC have often said, well, you know, at the end it boils down to political will. We can conceptualize the best new methodology and framework and all of that, Without the political will, none of them will work uh, and will deliver, um, which doesn't mean that the existing one can't be tweaked and the new methodology has certainly the potential to be better than the previous one. So there's, you know, but, but it's not going to short circuit the difficult political will at the moment and the situation that some of the biggest advocates of enlargement at the moment in the European Union are the ones who are not doing enlargement uh, a favor. They're in fact doing it a disservice by in not emphasizing rule of law and democracy to the degree we would like it to be. So I'll leave it with that um, uh, for, for now, Corina, back to you. Thank you so much, Florian. Um, quite a gloomy picture, if I understand you correctly. So, so this, this big issue of political will and how, how do we get to, um, to inspire more will at the political level in the Balkans and the EU? I mean, how, how can we raise the profile uh, of the dossier with political leaders on both sides given everything, okay, given the context uh, to which uh, Mr. Popovsky referred at the beginning as well, a, con a context which is very much um, influenced also by, by the, the, the COVID or post-COVID, if we, we can speak yet of a post-pandemic period um, fully. So uh, well, what can be done? Well, I think we have to le learn the lessons of COVID very well. I mean, one of the interesting observations of our opinion poll is also when we ask the citizens of the Western Balkans, which country or bloc will be the biggest help in coming out of the COVID crisis. So at a certain we're looking forward. Um, ironically, uh, in none of the countries uh, was the EU mentioned on first place, even though financially, um, it's absolutely no doubt that the European Union is the most important player but uh, in countries like Serbia, it's China. In the most of the other countries of the region, it's actually um, Serbia um, people are looking for. And, um, and in, place, in some places, it's the United States. So I think the EU is, as, as we see very often, not given the weight it actually plays. So it's not saying that the EU is not important. I mean, by all data, by all resources invested, it is by far the most important one. But you can see that Serbia through its vaccine diplomacy, for example, in the region has gathered a lot of support by making vaccines available when the EU wasn't doing it yet. Um, and this, this decision had an impact in the way in which citizens perceive Serbia in the future, not, not a, this was not about looking back towards who helped the most in the crisis, but it shows you that these symbolic acts, these acts of kind of public solidarity, visible solidarity, is something the EU is not very good at doing, um, and and it's not you know it's not the responsibility of DJ Near to do better in that, but it's part of the EU as a broader structure. But it is this kind of recognizing that there are these moments when acting in a visible public way helps and is very important for securing the visibility and also the credibility towards citizens where uh, some kind of more hollow gestures by others can create a much bigger uh, impact. And this is something the EU has to understand and, 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 and realize. And, and we can criticize you know, the other's opportunistic behavior, but if we don't learn the lessons and learn how the EU is better at communicating and in a certain way selling itself, then it's not going to, it's not going to work. And of course, the other question is, is, is more difficult of how to generate the political will in the EU itself. I mean, this is one, one problem we're seeing is also that um, in recent days, there's a lot of discussion about the crisis in Bosnia and Herzegovina across the region and talk about conflict and, and difficulties is hardly enticing in the EU itself. But of course, at the same time, we cannot ignore realities and say, well, let's make things look, give a paint a rosy picture of the Balkans because we can't, uh, we can't hurt the image in the EU. So it's a very tight walk for all of us who are in favor of enlargement and at the same time also think that we have to be speaking frank uh, to also the problems in the region. And that, that, that's, I mean, there's no easy way 
but I think more frankness also about the problems is necessary, while at the same time being in a certain way smarter about the symbolic uh, politics of the European Union. Um, thank you, Florian. Mr. Popovsky, do you think that more can be done in terms of public diplomacy and communication from, from the side of the, of the Commission to um, make it clear uh, about the important role that it's playing in the region? The short answer is yes, but let me develop. Look, I'll, I'll pick up on, on what Florian Bieber just said. Uh, indeed, um, uh, the, the symbolic solidarity matters, but we want to be more than that. Uh, and in a way, we already drew some lessons. You know, there was a there was a saying, maybe it was a party slogan in the old uh, East Germany: um, "Learning from the Soviet Union means learning how to win." Uh, so we, we we saw exactly what the uh, what the the Chinese did in the Balkans, and we did something similar, but much wet, but much better prepared. Hmm? So what, what, what Commissioner Varheli did in May was he jumped on a plane and went to all six capitals in a week to be there at the moment of the delivery of the first batch of Pfizer vaccines. Mm -hmm. So I called it a Pfizer jet trip. Uh, and it had an enormous impact. I spoke to all the heads of delegation. They said, yes, uh, it was a quantifiable number. I mean, it was 650,000 doses for the first batch of vaccines. And, and then much more followed later on, both through donations that we also managed to facilitate with member states and through the COVAX scheme of delivery. And actually the availability of vaccines is no longer a problem in the Balkans. The problem is anti-vax movement, which is not <laughs> something specific to the region, by the way. Huh? Um, so, in, you know, of course we, we wanted to be bit more active, but not shallow, mm, to, to show that we really have a, a, an offer. And indeed, we need to, to step up the, the communication effort. This is something that we do. By the way, uh, of course, the reception of the package was mixed, um, and, and it differed a lot from one country to another. But uh, I think that the media coverage was not bad at all. I, I just had a look at the stat statistics this morning. We had about 1,000 publications uh, only on traditional media. I'm not talking about uh, social media. Um, in Germany alone, it was almost 170 different uh, articles, mainly about Turkey, by the way, okay, for, for a reason that we can understand. Uh, but we want to build on that. And, and the challenge is, and I'm being very open here, that... Uh, uh, we are trying to sell a positive story, and, and good stories don't sell well. Hmm? If you have a bad story, something that is gloomy, you know, it's uh, about crisis and terrorism and what have you, then of course you reach much a bigger audience. Hmm? Mm -hmm. But that's the way it is. Um, uh, we're not going to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, we're not going to act like a, like a tabloid. Mm -hmm. um very interesting discussion. I think we're, we're going to come back to, to that shortly. And also, uh, very much appreciate the fact that um, I already see some hands that have been raised and questions uh, in our Q&A box. And I will shortly come to all of you. So um, I just beg a bit more patience because I'm very pleased to see Natasha is with, with us. A warm welcome, Natasha. Um, I'm very happy that, that you've made it. I know that um, it involved traveling and hurrying up to, to transfer to a location from which you could connect with us. So many thanks for your efforts and, and I hope that it, it wasn't too stressful in the end. Now, um, we've spent quite uh, some time before you, you've arrived discussing the way uh, in which the, the commission, uh, also the expert community perceives the, the situation in the Balkan countries uh, and on enlargement more generally. And I would now like to, to maybe shift a bit our attention to how citizens in the region see European integration. I mean, um, Florian already mentioned a couple of, um, of findings, but this year, again, BEPAG commissioned a new public opinion poll uh, in all of the Balkan countries. Um, last year, um, the survey covered uh, issues like conspiracy theory, uh, theories, elections, uh, the EU. Uh, this year, it looked at European integration, trust, and foreign actors. 
And we already know that um, the findings for foreign actors will be presented um, on 6th of December at an event which is planned in London. And then the results on trust um, will be uh, spoken about on 13th December at an event in Budapest. But for the European integration data, and Natasha and I um, worked together with also with other BIAPAC members on a brief, uh, which we've mentioned to you at the beginning. And um, uh, the link to this uh, brief was copy pasted in, um, in our chat box. And, um, and that brief came out last month. So now, Natasha, what have we learned from, from this year's BIAPAC survey? And, and how do you think that it links to, to what transpires from the recent uh, enlargement package? Thank you very much, uh, Corina, and I'm, I'm glad I, I made it eventually. Um, uh, apologies for, uh, for the delay. Um, so um, yes, as, as uh, you already said, Corina, the, what is, what is uh, interesting, what is perhaps original about this um, research is that we really focus on this um, on the citizen's perspective. I think a lot of um, uh, policy research, including by GEPAC, uh, focuses a lot on this um, dynamic at the intergovernmental level or at the, the institutional level between the, um, the EU institutions and the, the political leaders. And here, what we were interested in, and this is the second poll um, that we conduct, so we have a, a tiny kind of um, panel uh, structure in the data, is to really see how um, citizens view uh, European integration, also um, over time to build this uh, kind of these kind of time trends. And what we find when it comes to um, broad views of the enlargement process is um, that a large majority, and this is perhaps reassuring, of around 80% still support EU membership um, in the Western Balkans region of all the six countries that we look at. But Serbia presents, as in previous years, um, an outlier at um, this year, actually just over 50% uh, in favor of, uh, of enlargement. And we also find that while this large majority um, still exists, there are two limitations to this um, more optimistic finding, which is that on the one hand, the younger generation, so 18 to 28, nine years, are generally less in favor of EU accession than the older cohorts. And we also find heightened skepticism when it comes to the time horizon. So almost a quarter and believe their country will never enter the EU ever. And around 50% in both Serbia and North Macedonia do not believe that accession will happen in the next two decades. And um, so really translating a, a, a pretty deep disillusionment and also partial um, disengagement in the region from the aim of EU accession. And um, who is to blame for this trend? Of course, this is, um, uh, this is not all the blame is to be placed on the enlargement process per se. A third actually of respondents see um, their national governments as the, those mainly responsible for the slow progress. But um, in Kosovo, we find that almost 40% um, and in Serbia, almost a quarter of respondents place the greatest share of responsibility with the EU institutions. So um, really um, blaming um, EU actors directly for this um, slow progress. Why do these findings matter? Um, what, we, uh, what we find um, or what we argue in this policy brief is that we really have a the shift that is now translating also at the, at the citizen level from a transformative to a transactional view of EU accession, um, where this strong emphasis on the economic benefits on free movement um, rather than kind of democratic uh, standards translates a, an emerging preference actually for closer economic integration with the, um, with the EU member states over full EU membership. And this is of course quite significant when it comes to the commission's approach because it reduces citizens' ability to flank the EU's efforts to foster democratization in the region. Um, and for, from the EU perspective, it's certainly crucial to be able to count on this kind of um, bottom-up mobilization that's really vital for the long-term stability of any democratic reforms that are adopted during the um, accession process. So we, we draw a number of conclusions, um, essentially um, highlighting the need to really revive the transformative leverage of the um, enlargement process that has been somewhat lost um, in, in previous years and recommend um, that on the one hand, the EU institutions really need to develop a more credible narrative on enlargement in this post-crisis period. And so there's been a lot of um, rhetorical shift, but um, not always uh, sufficiently followed up by, um, by actions. And we, um, we uh, recommend or advise specifically um, meeting promises, opening negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia. I'm sure that this is something that has come up in the debate also before, um, uh, before I was able to join calling out also more explicitly the negative democratic developments in the region, stop praising, praising authoritarian leading leaders. This is um, disconcerting, especially to those citizens that see these trends quite visibly and don't feel supported in, um, in leaning up against them. Treat the Western Balkan countries as partners, um, for instance, by gradually opening the structural funds um, to the region, but also associating them with key initiatives. And, and here we single out 
um, the failure to invite the Western Balkans countries to the Conference on the Future of Europe really as a, um, as a shortcoming, as a missed opportunity to, to um, put out a hand to this region. And finally, um, linking back to EU member states themselves, of course, the EU needs to lead by example. And uh, this means when it comes to uh, dealing with Poland and Hungary, that the EU urgently needs to develop an effective way of dealing with democratic backsliding trends in its midst, lest it lose, of course, all credibility in advocating democratic reforms in um, candidate countries. And I'll leave it at this, and then we can put... Um, Thank you so much, um, uh, Natasha, for giving us the headlines. I won't follow up uh, with questions directly to you. I will just open up the discussion at this point because we have collected quite a number of, of questions in our chat box, but also we have people waiting um, and willing to, to intervene. And maybe I will take... Um, I will sort of cluster some of the uh, uh, questions that we've been posed in the Q&A box, which relate a lot to the conversations the conversation we were having before you've joined us, Natasha, and that has to do with um, basically the role of the member states and how do we get them to be more constructive in this process. Um, the, the role, particularly with regard to the decision for North Macedonia and Albania, but also on the visa liberalization um, uh, for Kosovo has have been mentioned in our chat box. And, um, and also another interesting um, uh, question here links precisely to what you said, um, Natasha, about how member states um, can look hypocritical in some sense when it comes to emphasizing democratic criteria, but then them th they themselves not living up to them. So how do we um, um, make also the conditions that we're asking, we're putting on those countries more, more credible um, and therefore more effective? So that's one sort of set of questions. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm sort of, I have to cluster them, otherwise we won't get through all of them. And then I would like to, um, to invite um, John Palmer to pose his question because his hand has been up for quite some time. John, are you with us? Do you want to pose your question at this point? Please, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. We Thank can you. Hear you. Go ahead. Uh, as someone who is old enough to have lived through the process of the initial creation of the European Union, and then subsequently over decades in Brussels as a journalist and a, a founder of the European Policy Centre, I've looked with increasing alarm at uh, more than the flagging pace, the real danger of failure in the enlargement process. And I want to touch on just uh, two aspects of this as a question. In previous uh, stages, both of the creation of the union and indeed of its uh, 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 enlargement processes, as well as the official institutions, the commission, etc., member states, political parties in the member states, civil society organizations, played an active part in canvassing and in encouraging uh, popular uh, uh, support in applicant countries for uh, 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 membership of the European Union. Uh, it shouldn't all fall, as it were, on the Commission, uh, however vital a role they have. So what I'm asking is, at what point will the existing member states, who at least, we're told, support uh, the enlargement of the European Union, not least in their own security, democratic interests, etc., play a part in the confronting some of the false arguments and the prejudices there. I'm thinking of the ridiculous question of the language issue between Bulgaria uh, 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 and North Macedonia, which should be a matter for academics and historians to solve. Um, should not the pro-Europeans actually play a more active part in the policy debate in the applicant uh, countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Palmer. And now I, I'd like to also allow Santiago Escobar to pose his question before I come back to the panel. Yes, thank you very much. You can hear me well? Yes. Please. Awesome, perfect. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question about conditionality because if I understood it correctly and by reading the page, 
uh, the document, you see a lot of use of positive conditionality with the use of incentives and so on. Uh, and I was wondering whether negative conditionality is also foreseen, which is uh, an option that the Commission has used, for example, on areas of migration and so on. So I was wondering about that and also about the communication with citizens, um, which connects very well to this question about rule of law with uh, candidate uh, with uh, actual members. So how to communicate this also to the citizens um, about use of conditionality, both in positive and negative ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Escobar. Um, I, I, I'll come back to, to our speakers now, maybe uh, allowing first Mr. Bobowski to cherry pick and, and react to some of the questions. I mean, and also um, maybe if he wishes to react to what Natasha has presented. Indeed. Thank you very much. And thank you for clustering. Clustering works, as you see. Um, indeed, I wanted to react to a point by, by Natasha to, to one of the findings of your report, namely, um, I, I, I beg to differ a bit in the sense that I, I, I think that this um, trying to, um, uh, to define our relationship as, as either transactional or transformational is, is a false dichotomy. Of course, you, you can see that what we put at the very center of the process now is the economic and investment plan, but it's not an alternative to enlargement. It is there to promote transition. When you look into that, into the different flagship projects, they are very much aligned with the EU big priorities, Green Deal, digital transition, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, uh, it's also a transformational tool. And the second objective uh, behind the economic and investment plan uh, was COVID response. And we wanted to have a, a, a big tool uh, to help the countries uh, um, uh, recover from, from the COVID, uh, COVID crisis. Um, now, on the uh, specific questions asked, and uh, well, I couldn't agree more with, with John Palmer and, and his very wise rebuke on member states, because uh, no, it cannot be us alone preaching in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, I mean, Florian uh, Bieber mentioned this discussion ahead of the Bredo summit on the E-word, which is uh, 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 yet another buzzword that we use. So we are not, not only living in the world of, in the world of, of, of emails and e-cigarettes, but uh, there's also this E-word, which is, which is an irritant to, to many. And, and this, this is the big difference uh, between the, the, the big wave of enlargement in 2004 and 7 and, and now, because back then we had a lot of difficulties, but nobody questioned the overall direction. And now we have to fight this uphill battle every time we go to the council. And, and now uh, we are in the middle of the negotiations again. Hopefully uh, everybody has drawn conclusion, conclusions from what happened uh, uh, exactly uh, uh, a year ago. But indeed we need a bit of more positive communication, not only doom and gloom and, 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 and scary stories, uh, uh, not always fact-based, by the way. I mean, uh, um, the example that I used to give, I mean, I've, I've been given for the last four or five years is, you know, um, is the, uh, the radicalization. People claim it's a very dangerous phenomenon. Yes, it is, but it's not specific to the Balkans. There are about 1,000 people who left to Syria and Iraq from the whole region. And there are about 400 from Belgium alone. So if you put these two together, then you can see that, you know, these this stories are being spun in a way that has nothing to do with, uh, with, with reality. So we need, we need member states indeed much more with us uh, on, on that. Uh, on the issue of principles and, 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 and the centrality of the rule of law, of course, no, we are not. We are living in an interconnected world. So uh, all the candidates are watching us, um, and I don't want to go into details. I mean, we know of. We are fully aware of the discussion going on within the EU. The conclusion for us is to be very strict, and very principled on on the on the issue of uh, of conformity with the rule of law standards of the of the of the EU, and that's why um, why we made it actually a, a backbone of the new uh, methodology. And then on the conditionality, I mean, it is there. First of all, uh, the, the, the process, I mean, the political steer that is uh, embedded in the, in the new methodology allows for 
uh, you know, for acceleration, but also for slowing down the process if there is not enough progress. And uh, also when it comes to the, to the financial assistance, um, in the new regulation on the, the pre-accession instrument called IPA3, now it's already the third edition, um, there is something called uh, called modulation. I mean, it's, it, I'm not sure it's a, it's a right English word, but it is it is there. So, which would allow us to to adapt the level uh, or the intensity of our uh, financial cooperation to the to the pace of uh, of reforms. So, it is uh, it is an option. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Popovsky. Uh, Florian, uh, why do you think the member states have lost? Um, a disagreement on on the on the direction um, in which we're, we're we we should be moving on the dossier. I mean, this is just to follow immediately after Mr. Popovsky's mm. intervention. But of course, please feel free to um, choose also uh, among the questions that have been posed. I mean, I think there there the, the the irony is, of course, that the countries which have been uh, obstacles uh, for the enlargement process at the moment are not always the the skeptics about enlargement. I mean, you know, Bulgaria is not a country which has been a skeptic. I mean, it was pushing at the Sofia summit uh, heavily for the E word. And now it's, the, the, you know, it's become the biggest obstacle at the moment for enlargement. So I think it's not that, that uh, the EU is divided into the skeptics and the supporters of enlargement, but that some countries for whatever domestic reasons, opportunistic reasons might object to a particular aspect of enlargement, which of course has damage on the whole process. And this is, I think, the challenge. So it's not this kind of neat divide between the skeptics and the, and the, and the supporters. Also, we have some supporters who are supporting enlargement for not the reasons which are rule of law based uh, uh, EU integration and value based EU integration. That's also undermines enlargement. I think enlargement can only be helped by countries who support it also sometimes critically, but based on merits and based on values. Uh, everything else is actually doing the enlargement a disservice because if you, uh, if you are the prime minister of Hungary and you visit uh, Biro Radovic uh, and don't go to Sarajevo uh, on, a, on a visit, uh, then you know, you're sending a signal also in the European Union that you're not really playing by the rules of the European Union and the way in which we understand our engagement in the region. And this, this is of course, are harmful. And I think this is something which we have to recognize. We also have to recognize, I think the problem is that um, we have seen this kind of individual member states um, hijacking or vetoing. And the problem is that, of course, once Bulgaria might be convinced to give up its objections, we have no guarantee that other member states will not do the same thing. I mean, this is, it's kind of become easy. It's become an easy and a certain way of uh, thing to do. Uh, and, and I think the problem is the EU I mean, we, uh, we've been saying, you know, uh, qualified majority voting would be the best way out of it for most steps of the enlargement process until the very end, when, of course, individual member states have to ratify the, 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 the agreement. But knowing that this is difficult to achieve, the only alternative is to raise the price for vetoes, basically raise the cost for vetoes. And that can only happen if other member states say this is unacceptable, because we know exactly which other countries might be uh, future veto players in the region. There are quite a few, and I can think of one or two who are very likely to abuse this power because it is a temptation. And with this temptation in the room and, with, and it being easily available, it's very hard not to not to use it unless the price becomes higher. So we have to think about that and also maybe think about, you know, not just dividing EU between the skeptics and the supporters, but rather saying who is supporting enlargement for what reasons. And actually many of, you know, we have a position now where France, which is conventionally considered a skeptic, has been in favor of opening negotiations with uh, North Macedonia and Albania. So, uh, we're in a bit of an upside down world on that. We have to I think, acknowledge that in our thinking also. Yes, thank you so much, Florian. Natasha, um, we've heard from Mr. Popovsky about the importance of positive stories. And, and, and of course, I can't help thinking that North Macedonia, um, one could easily say that it, it was a, a positive story on which to build, to build progress and to advance. Um, how do you see recent developments in, in North Macedonia? And, and do you think that this is already hinting at um, what can the negative, potentially negative consequences of, of, of EU's, of the member states' lack of commitment that we've been discussing? 
Thank you, Corina. I think in, in, indeed what we're seeing in, in Macedonia is, is kind of foreshadowing this um, a positive story uh, going on, um, essentially, where um, the EU, but also in conjunction with, um, with Macedonian citizens back in 2016-17, played a very crucial role in um, ending Grevsky's rule and returning uh, the country onto a path towards EU accession, with much hope, of course, attached to um, Zoran Zaev and his, uh, his team and really bringing concrete progress um, on the accession uh, path after multiple years, of course, of positive recommendations on the part of the Commission, repeatedly blocked by, uh, by different uh, individual member states for bilateral reasons that, that did not have anything to do with the country's effective progress. And I think the fact that we really see here essentially the despair of, the, um, of, of Zoran Zaev as a person and saying, I tried everything I could, and I really feel that this um, this electoral um, uh, defeat in the municipal elections is a sign that this this path is not being honored, that it that it's not um, uh, kind of sufficient, uh, and that I've not been able to deliver on the European pro um, um, process against the obstacles that have been uh, placed in my path is, I think, uh, very risky, and, and letting the country go um, down that path um, could could lead to um, kind of a deep deep deception also on the part of the broader region in the EU again, not living up to its um, its promises and uh, and yeah, failing to honor the efforts made domestically. If I could just follow up on this this question of this um, false dichotomy between transactional transformation, so I think indeed um, we're we're not so much trying to say that it's one or the other, but I think what is required in the accession process is to keep a balance between saying on the one hand, of course, it's about concrete benefits. And of course, it's normal for citizens to expect these concrete benefits from entering. But ideally, there should be something more. And, and, and Ajit was sold as this kind of vision, transformation, democratization. And I think this, this story, this part of the story is somewhat becoming lost. And we're losing this balance between something um, that is about common values, as, as uh, Florian was describing before, going towards something that is more about concrete benefits and kind of this, this um, cost benefit calculation that I think is, is less than what enlargement could inspire to, um, uh, yeah, when it comes to, to citizens buying. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Natasha. Uh, let's take um, a couple more questions. So I will invite uh, uh, shortly uh, Andre de Munte to, to post his question live. Um, but before that, I just want to read a couple of the questions that we have in written sent by our participants. So the, some of uh, them are directly addressing um, the commission. And so, Mr. Popovsky, um, we have a question about um, how to deal with the political situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So if you could elaborate a little bit more about um, the situation in this country and how, how do you see the, um, the, the next steps, but also um, uh, we have a question asking again, uh, you, Mr. Popovsky, uh, the Commission's new methodology talks of integrating countries gradually in the single market by phasing in. Um, how would this work in practice? Um, one of our um, participants is asking. And maybe to all of uh, our speakers, a question about, okay, so do we need to start looking at alternatives? Um, and what kind of um, alternatives would there be um, uh, available? Um, is, for example, the uh, phased membership idea uh, that was recently put forward uh, by um, CEP Belgrade uh, a, a way to go, or do we have any other thoughts on how we can proceed? And so those are for reflections, but now, Please, Andrew Demunte, do you want to come in? Andre, are you with us? Oh, yes, he is. You're muted, Andre. Now okay. it should be okay. Now it's perfect, tell us. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, good afternoon to everybody. I mean, my question, uh, question slash comment would be to Mr. Uh, Popovsky. I mean, I want to go back to uh, this uh, trip to the six Western Balkan countries of uh, President von der Leyen. 
And uh, my first question would be, uh, I mean, I saw statements uh, on the website of the External Action Service on four of these visits and two are lacking. They were lacking at the time, they are still lacking about North Macedonia and uh, Montenegro where I don't find uh, anything. But what I would like to address is what she said in Serbia where she spoke about how amazing the progress was and there was enormous progress. Now the question I don't want to ask you is how did you feel when you uh, heard that uh, in DG Near? The second question I do not want to ask you is who briefed Ms. von der Leyen uh, for that uh, visit to the Western Balkans? Uh, but, uh, I mean, my question would be, do you think that it is a coincidence that in uh, that the vast majority of analyses after the publication of the enlargement package focused and still focuses on the uh, Serbia uh, report because people see that on fundamentals, this is, uh, th this is not what they thought. Uh, the analysis uh, would be. Uh, as you probably know, we are very active in the European Parliament on that as well. There have been parliamentary questions from 12 uh, MEPs, which were submitted on the 11th of October. Uh, it is still under heavy scrutiny, and I think more uh, will be uh, will be coming. Uh, questions uh, have also been submitted a couple of days ago in the Dutch Parliament uh, on the Serbia progress report, well, progress report, uh, sorry, this is really a lapsus, on the Serbia annual report uh, to the Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs. Uh, so I would like to, 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 to have your views on this, uh, if possible. If I can make a comment on the side, I thought the uh, visit to Bosnia and Herzegovina, in my view, was too much designed uh, to the liking of Croatia. I mean, you can build in an event and then have a press conference where the first speaker is Mr. Plenkovic for seven minutes and then Zoran Tegeltia. I mean, the name was unknown, I think, because in the address it was Dear Andre, but I didn't find Dear Zoran. Uh, this may be a parenthesis, but still, um, I, I think I perceive this as giving too much of a platform to uh, a, a prime minister of an EU member state, and it made me think of, of the uh, Sigurna Hrvatska uh, incident at the time. But maybe a last thing on Serbia, I was Very really good. astonished, really, and I, I'm concluding here, I was really astonished uh, to, to see not to find the word glorification or glorify in the Serbia report, which is 135 pages long. And I know everything has to fit in there. The only thing I found was the vague reference, Serbian authorities continue to provide support and public space to convicted war criminals. And I would like uh, you to comment, uh, maybe this falls outside of the scope of the report, on uh, what uh, Interior Minister Vulin said a couple of days ago, like banning people uh, to, 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 to try and erase the graffiti uh, of uh, Ratko Mladic, which made uh, Natasha Kandic say, well, my proposal is then that you make that wall uh, part of your office, otherwise you will have to guard it around the clock. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, a lot of questions directed to Mr. Popovsky, so I'd like to allow him to gather his thoughts and maybe we start, uh, maybe Natasha, you go first for a change just to spice it up a little bit in terms of the order, um, if, if you don't mind. Thank you, Robin, on, on your question regarding phased membership alternatives um, that, that you were asking before, perhaps. I think a lot of it is about how, how does the EU go about things, and, and indeed it will be, be interesting to hear um, the, the different pressures, of course, that the, that the Commission is under increasing all of the stakeholders involved in writing these reports. And, but I think um, I, I do see some value in, in thinking um, uh, uh, in terms of um, phased membership. I mean, of course, it's no, it's no a radically new idea, because for a long time now we've been saying, could there be something about um, uh, was not second tier membership because then you get into the whole um, symbolic and um, value of it, but the idea of intermediary walls and saying, of course, for the Western Balkans, the benchmark um, is higher. This is normal due to the experience that we've had both with countries that have um, entered prematurely or with countries that have um, reverted to a, to a state of democracy that was um, that's considered less desirable subsequent to their accession. So I, I do think it's normal for accession conditionality to be um, of course, more more ambitious, more sophisticated for the Western Balkan countries. But then the, the whole question becomes how do you um, how do you keep them on board? And I think one, one of the things we see in our survey is that indeed keeping citizens on board over what is meanwhile, um, yeah, basically over, over two decades since uh, since that first promise of a European perspective is extremely hard. And so I think 
thinking in that direction, but thinking in the direction associating people from the region. So I think it's really important for any kind of um, structural change to the enlargement process to really be coordinated with um, domestic partners in the Western Balkans so as not to be perceived as basically just another way of saying we're keeping you at bay. Um, would, would, what kind of intermediary rewards would those be and how do they differ, for instance, from the, um, the intermediary rewards that are now foreseen in the new uh, methodology? So I, I think one, one, one crucial um, uh, issue is for, for Kosovo, of course, this, uh, this long, long wait for visa liberalization that I think did have some positive impact um, on the remaining countries from the region when that was first granted, both in terms of speeding up reforms prior to granting it, but also in terms of feeling like making this effort is actually um, something positive. And then more broadly, yes, I think some ideas are, of course, already there, um, phasing in, um, phasing in uh, financial um, aid. But I think there, of course, the approach has been top down. So we develop a new methodology and you buy into the methodology, supposedly voluntarily. But of course, you know, what is the alternative of saying, well, we'll stick to an old process that you would like to do away with. So I think it's it's really important to design these kinds of shifts in dialogue um, with um, with not only governments in the region, because those are sometimes actually the obstacles to 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 progress, but to to wider partners um, in society. Hmm. Yes, thank you so much, Natasha. Um, Mr. Popovsky, are you ready to come in at this point, or should I go to Florian first? Well, I'm in your hands, but I can come in now if you want me to. Okay. Uh, first, on the, the situation in, in Bosnia, um, there's never a dull moment. Uh, and I think we reacted pretty quickly to the announcement of President Dodik to withdraw from the state institutions. And, and by the way, the, the, the vote in the Assembly of Republika Srpska didn't take place. And, uh, and it's still tense, although uh, we managed to overcome some obstacles. For instance, the mandate of the EU Operation Altea has been extended. It was hanging uh, on the thread at, for, for some time in New York, but we are past that stage. So that's very positive because we need the operation as a stabilizing factor. And we continue our engagement. So a, a week ago or 10 days ago, um, there was a joint visit of senior officials from the EAS uh, DG Nier and the U.S. State Department to Bosnia. And they spoke to all stakeholders uh, and, and had a very clear message on, on the need to re-engage and, and to stabilize and to re-engage and, and, and to finally kick off this, this long overdue process of constitutional reforms. We know that things don't work, but don't make it even worse. And, and we are there to, uh, to help. Um, the um, you know, this gradual integration, which I would cluster uh, uh, with, the, with the question of faith membership, it's not the same, of course. Uh, you know, labeling can be, can be counterproductive because if we, if we put too much emphasis on something called gradual uh, uh, faith membership, then it means we are, we are just putting the whole, uh, of, we, are, we don't believe in the end phase, in the finalité of the enlargement process, which, which is not the case. Uh, we would like to share as many benefits, but also obligations of membership in advance, because it's also very good for the necessary adaptation process. And it's already happening, many areas. One, I mean, you know, the, we have over the last um, couple of years, we basically doubled the number of Erasmus scholarships, for instance. Huh? I gave already before the example of the extension of the green lanes, uh, transport green lanes to the Balkans during the, the first phase of the COVID crisis. And there is much more uh, to, to come. Uh, we also, uh, what we also do a lot is anticipation. So our teams here in, 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 in the engineer, um, they have a very, uh, they keep a close eye on all the new policy initiatives that have to do with the Green Deal or the G digital acts, etc. And they scrap all those initiatives to make sure that they are, first of all, to avoid negative impact on the Balkans, but also to see whether they can benefit the countries at that stage without waiting for the actual membership to, uh, to happen. So that would be that would be the practical, uh, uh, you know, aspect of of a uh, of a phased in uh, of uh, of phased in, in integration or gradual um, 
uh, integration. But we should not, we must not lift it to the level of a, of a, of a new policy because then it can backfire. I mean, I, again, I, I always uh, refer to my own experience from 20 something years ago. And, and, and you know, the Brussels was buzzing with all the concepts of, uh, uh, you know, Kern Europa and, and, and concentric circles, etc. And it was intellectually thrilling, but politically very dangerous because it was undermining the collective effort of the whole enlargement community. So, so this is something to be uh, to be avoided. Uh, on the uh, the Serbia report, look, I, I think we we objectively we saw progress. It's not ideal, uh, and we still uh, want Serbia to make uh, uh, I mean to catch up and 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 to go ahead. But of course, they need to comply with the conditions, and the report is very clear on that. I mean, there is no there is no free riding. Uh, and, and we see a lot of engagement from the current government. And I know that both President Vucic and uh, the government of Prime Minister Brnabic would like to make the best possible use of this now relatively calm period ahead of the triple election in, in March, April 2022. And I think it's a, there is a real opportunity uh, in the... Um, I'm sure you can find a lot of nouns that have not been used in the in the Serbia report. I mean, I think that you know we we are careful with the language because it's been read by everybody through different angles. So so that's the uh, that would be my answer. And on the trip, look, I'm not counting the press releases on the EAS website. I'm sorry. Um, uh, the visit of President von der Leyen was very successful. Uh, I was asked who briefed the president, and the answer is simple. I did, together with my director for the Balkans. The president spent about two hours going through all the country files, and I think she was quite well prepared, and, and, and came back uh, in, in a very good spirit, because she, she, she really thought it was timely, and she went there with the right message. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Popovsky. Florian. Yes, thanks. A couple of quick points. I mean, the first one regarding the staged uh, accession process idea. I mean, I think uh, I, I commented on that uh, uh, suggestion by Tseps and Tsepp um, uh, before, and I think it's a good idea, but the problem is, that, of course, does it resolve everything? And I would agree with Mr. Popovsky that maybe, um, you know, these ideas are, are, are intellectually very interesting. The question is, is that really what is, where the process is hinging on? Is this the problem which makes the thing not work? And I'm not sure it is. I think it's more the lack of political will on both sides. And you can find the best process in the world. None of them will resolve that, that fundamental problem. And I think this is what our policy brief of BPEG is arguing more about, that, this is, that, that we should focus on that rather than reinventing the wheel every two years of how to do the process of enlargement. I mean, I think on the, on the issue of... Um, of, on the issue of, of the status of Serbia, I mean, I, and, and I, I do think I, I would agree with Andre's observation um, that uh, Ursula von der Leyen's statement that there's a lot of progress made does really ring hollow, um, considering the situation in Serbia, where we have no democratic elections uh, last time around, and where the situation of media freedom has not improved. So, you know, there might be formal improvements, but the overall situation is that Serbia is uh, the least democratic country in the region at the moment, and uh, certainly one where we don't see any uh, immediate prospect of improvement. I mean, the elections next year are not guaranteed to be free and fair. Um, we don't see a clear commitment by the government for that. And uh, so this, uh, I think, does ring alarm bells, and I think ones where uh, I, I've been wishing for a greater clarity from the European Union on this matter and uh, from the line statement that there's great progress made in the rule of law. Really, I think if people in Serbia and observing Serbia could not, uh, could not believe that they have to uh, see such statements, which are kind of indirect electoral support for the current government. And I think the, the last point I want to make is that uh, I think what, we, what the whole crisis of enlargement means the EU has to also think in other foreign policy and engagements in the Western Balkans. It has to think about on one side how to bring treat the countries as future member states um, and include them, which I think some of the points which Mr. Popovsky made are indeed uh, going in that direction. But also think about that enlargement is not going to resolve all the problems in the region. You know, enlargement is not going to resolve the problems in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Enlargement is not going to resolve Serbia Kosovo. The enlargement is not the incentive which is going to convince Serbia to make a normalization agreement with Kosovo 
Um, so there has to be a thinking of what can the EU do in terms of its engagement in the region, which includes both uh, rewards and uh, penalties, um, uh, which is beyond saying you open a chapter or you don't open a chapter or you cluster or whatever else, but thinking about it beyond that, because otherwise I don't think there will be any resolution of the status. And this was one of the questions uh, also asked, you know, uh, maybe much more energy of member states should be invested in convincing fellow member states to recognize Kosovo. That might be a much more promising prospect than um, trying to end, you know, kind of bring this process to a result. I mean, I hope it will end, but I don't see any, any, any incentive for the parties currently to come to a conclusion. So I think we have to think more about EU's engagement in the Western Balkans much more broadly than just enlargement. And I think a lot more clear words would be welcome as well. Okay. Well, we're very close to um, our end time, uh, but before we, we before we part ways, um, I just wanted to ask each of you in one minute to to tell me one recommendation or one thing that you would like to happen to see enlargement move forward in the next period. What do you think is um, a critical um, development that needs to occur um, to instigate more positive dynamism in, in, in the policy. And of course, you can address it to whomever you think is the most relevant to, to address it to. Um, maybe I'll start again from, from Natasha, if I, if I may. <laughs> Get the shortest reflection time. Well, I um... I think my, my point would be um, about rebuilding credibility and um, rebuilding credibility in two regards. On the one hand of the enlargement promise uh, and of this actually being something that will happen not in two decades, not in three, but actually in a, in a realistic future that um, people currently living in the region can envisage. Um, and on the other hand of the EU's um, conditionality and in particular of its democratic conditionality, because I think that one of the main um, deceptions for me, but also I know to a lot of um, activists in the region that have um, been very vocal on, on democratic reforms, is to see that the EU has been meandering around and kind of sidestepping this issue in favor of achieving concrete progress, achieving, I mean, many of the things I think we, we also heard now, adopting a more transactional take because eventually this will lead to, and I think here we see it with Poland and Hungary so clearly, this, this avoiding the issue is not at all a solution. And I think if we have any leverage now, it would be to, um, to rebuild credibility, to make clear that enlargement will happen, but also to make clear that um, the current direction that many of the countries are taking is not going in the direction of enlargement. And, and, and what do you think um, that building credibility, that enlargement will happen would entail more specifically? Is it enough for the member states to now um, finally give green light to North Macedonia and Albania, or is it something more? Do we need dates? Do we need, I mean, there was a question about the dates that I didn't I didn't pose, but yeah. I'm not in favor of dates because I think the, the risk of the date is that um, once, once you give it, it's very hard to backtrack. But I think what, what, you, what you can do is to say, we're, we're opening up negotiations now, which also allows us to say very clearly, what are the shortcomings and what is the benchmark against which annually progress is measured? And really to, to reconnect the top down and the bottom up more clearly again and to allow um, civil society in the region to say, look, the EU is actually not saying anything and nothing and whoever wants can read whatever they wanted to the reports, but is actually saying this was a very problematic decision. And if this is maintained, then there can be no further opening of further chapters. Okay. Thank you so much, Natasha. Florian. Yes, it's difficult because I know it's hard to make recommendations when, you know, it depends on so many actors. I mean, I would say, um, getting Bulgaria to drop the veto and make sure that the cost of doing vetoes is very high so that no other country will be soon tempted to engage in the same issue um, would be one thing. And uh, I think I fully agree with Natasha's point, greater clarity and democracy conditionality. Because again, I mean, I think there will be no enlargement at the end of the day if, without the EU sorting out its own rule of law democracy concerns within the union. I mean, that's that's quite uh, obvious. So Macron is right on that level. level. It just means that enlargement shouldn't stop until that is achieved. It just means that it probably will not happen unless the EU deals with it in a, in a kind of structural way. But it also means that once it's dealt with it in a structural way, it can communicate it again more credibly towards the outside, but also not help to resolve every democracy question before enlargement, but can also deal with them afterwards. But I think putting democracy more at the center of the message and also of the clear communication would be helpful. 
but ha hasn't democracy been at the center for, for a decade now? What, what would make it, I mean, I absolutely agree with the point that the member states need to set the example and live by the standards that they set for others. But when it comes to, to, the, to the policy or to the fundamentals being clearer, how can they be clearer? Well, uh, again, I mean, I think we, we, we see, uh, and I mean, it's, it's an old metaphor I've been using, we see the trees, but we don't see the forest. I mean, the reports and all of the, all of the analysis, and also the statements uh, are not clearly pointing of saying, you know, we don't hear the commission president saying, uh, Serbia has a serious problem with democracy. Uh, it needs to engage in substantial reforms to ensure it's a functional democracy uh, as you know, all international observers and observatory uh, indices suggest is it is far and it's declined drastically in the last 10 years. This kind of language, this kind of clarity is needed. So it's not saying, oh, it needs to do this reform and that reform, but it's, you know, it's one thing advising a country and a government committed to democratic reforms to say that it needs to do certain things better. And it's another thing to say that there's been serious, substantial backsliding on core indicators of democracy. And that has a, you know, a, a, a chilling effect on the country and its neighbors. And you know, there, this is the kind of clarity where I think lots of people who are in favor of democracy in their country feel left in the rain, so to speak, by the European Union. And that needs to change. Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much for this clarification. Mr. Popovsky, you have the final word. Well, uh, um, look, what we need is courage and foresight. Courage to take the necessary decisions in December, to adopt conclusions and to uh, adopt negotiating frameworks and to hold the intergovernmental conferences with Macedonia, Albania, Serbia, and Montenegro. And we need foresight to figure out uh, what would happen if we don't take decisions in December? Thank you. Um, do you think that knowing the potential negative effect of what uh, would happen would help persuade member states to, to, to get their act together on enlargement? I hope so. I mean, it's not it's not scaremongering. I mean, it's just it's just a fact, and and it was pretty bad last year, and we don't want it to happen again. And I think we've we've learned the lessons. Okay, absolutely. But thank you very much. We've come to the end of our uh, uh, discussion and 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 um, an event. I really am very grateful uh, to our speakers for for bearing with me and um, and and answering. Um, tough questions uh, from our participants and from myself. I really appreciate it. And uh, many thanks also to our participants for showing up in such uh, great numbers and for being so active. This shows that enlargement is still relevant, it's still important, it's still salient, and um, it's, it's still work in progress. Um, many thanks to everyone, a wonderful evening, and I look forward to our uh, next conversation on this topic. Goodbye.